So I would like to switch over to the second paper. And I would like to invite Simon and Morton to the stage. The paper is on the coming battle of digital currencies. So it sounds very belligerent. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Simon is an assistant professor in finance at HEC Paris. And uh, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at Chicago Booth during the academic year 2021-2022. So we are looking forward to your presentation. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. I guess I can stand up for yeah. the presentation. <laughs> thanks so much for inviting me. It's a great conference, great paper, great start of the day. And thanks for everyone for joining. It's a pleasure to be here to present. So as the name says today, today I'm presenting a paper that's called CBDC. That's the capital letter of the the words here, the coming battle of digital currencies can also be abbreviated CBDC. And it's joint work with Will Song from Cornell University and myself from HEC Paris. I jump right in. In the recent past, we have essentially seen and observed tremendous changes regarding payments and currencies. In particular, we have observed the rise of private payment systems that operate kind of outside of the traditional banking system. Examples of that are PayPal, Alipay, and PESA. And clearly, these developments have kind of upset regulators in some of the countries. More recent phenomenon was the rise of cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance, as well as their fall recently. And one particular interesting development in this context are essentially stable coins, which are kind of a form of private money that has grown somewhat important up to some point and has reached a market cap of about 100 billion US dollars. Before there was a crash and then the market kept dropped a little bit. All these developments regarding digital assets, digital currencies and digital finance have attracted enormous attention from regulators and policymakers around the globe. To give you an example of that, uh, in the context of the US, March 9, 2022, President Biden essentially signed an executive order on digital assets in which he urged federal agencies to look more into the regulation of digital assets, as well as into the development of a digital dollar, a so-called central bank digital currency. And more generally speaking, there's a growing interest in central bank digital currencies, in short CBDC. And at this point, I would like to note that the discussant of this paper has thought about this topic much earlier than we have thought about it. He has published a paper around about this topic already 2017. The following map gives you an idea about the state of CBDC initiatives around the globe. And simply, the fact that most of this map is colored means that many central banks around the globe are at least looking into CBDC, if not having already developed a pilot, proof of concept, or even rolled out a CBDC. And one large country that's pretty much ahead in these pursuits, for instance, ahead of Europe or the US, is China with its Irenminbi. And China in particular has already rolled out a large scale pilot regarding CBDC. And interestingly, the implementation or of this pilot of the ECNY not only has um, caused some debates in China, but also has triggered some debates in the US, which where some of the opinions, but certainly not all of the opinions, reflected a concern that the, the ECNY might challenge the US, domin US dollar dominance. Of course, this is a debate. Some people don't believe it, some people believe in it. But there's just one example of an article that voices this opinion, which is Ehrlich 2020 in Forbes, which has this nice title, Not a Cold War, China is using a digital currency insurgency to unseat the US dollar. Another example or another event that got central banks uh, going on to think about CBDC was essentially Facebook's Libra i.e. an attempt to launch a large-scale private digital currency. So in 2019, Facebook essentially proposed its digital currency initiative Libra, and Libra was supported by a consortium of big tech companies uh, or smaller tech companies and payment companies led by Facebook. As you all know, Facebook, Libra was never realized, especially because they faced quite some headwinds from regulators. And it's clear why, because if Libra, a large-scale private digital currency, had been launched, had been widely adopted, it would be clearly a threat to public money. But going forward, there might be the possibility that at some point such a private digital currency or large-scale digital currency might be launched, and this might actually give some rise to preemptive actions to prevent this going forward. So what do we do in this paper? Essentially, all of these developments hint that there might be, going forward, a battle of digital currencies. 
And if so, then there are many questions to answer. For instance, how does this coming battle of digital currency shape the future of money, as well as currency competition between fiat currencies, CBDC, and private digital currencies? And should countries react to, uh, um, react to the competition by private currencies by digitizing their currency, for instance, by implementing CBDC or by doing something else? And this is a re research agenda on its own. We in this paper just take a small step in kind of rationalizing some of the developments we see or formalizing kind of the developments we see. And in particular, we de develop a relatively simple and stylized framework of currency competition, which differs from the ones we essentially know from the traditional literature in that countries can essentially choose endogenously whether to digitize their currency, whether to innovate, in particular, whether to launch CBDC. And this kind of can be interpreted as a game theoretic analysis of countries strategies or timing decisions when to digitize their money or launch CBDC. So let me give a bit more context. In particular, we develop a dynamic model of currency competition between two national currencies, let's call them A and B, and one representative cryptocurrency C, which can be interpreted broadly and describes also other private payment systems, including stable coins. And we call country A the strong country, i.e. currency A is dominant, the strong currency, think of currency A as the US dollar, and B is a relatively weaker, but maybe also strong currency. Think of it maybe as the renminbi or the euro. It's just not the dominant currency, it's just a little bit weaker. And these currencies fulfill essentially the three functions of money in that they potentially serve as a store of value, i.e. in our model, the households use money to store their wealth across time, they serve kind of as a medium of exchange in that, they provide, in that money provides liquidity services. In other words, holding money gives you some convenience. You get some convenience yield from holding money. And last, money can also serve as a unit of account, which also can be essentially captured by assuming a convenience yield to money. And in this model, there's a third currency, cryptocurrency C, that competes essentially with the two national currencies A and B. And in particular, there's some dynamics in that cryptocurrency grows and is dynamically adapted over time. I.e., over time, national currencies face more and more competition from this new form of private money. And as such, the countries strategically react to this competition by digitizing their currency, which could be by launching CBDC, but could be also by doing some other things, maybe upgrading the payment rates. And let me quickly highlight the main results before going into more detail. In this model, there are feedback effects in currency competition, which naturally lead to some form of dollarization, i.e. the stronger currency kind of dollarizes the weaker one. And this is bad for the weaker one. Once you add crypto to this model, then essentially the cryptocurrency acts as a kind of buffer zone amid the competition between the two currencies and therefore may mitigate the adverse dollarization weaker currencies are exposed to. As I said, Cryptocurrency as a form of private money is dynamically growing and adopted, which poses some competition for the national currencies. And as such, the national currencies react and digitize the currency or launch CBDC. And in particular, in this model, there is some pecking order in that the country with a relatively strong but non-dominant currency benefits the most from launching CBDC early on. In particular, in our model, it can gain some so-called first mover advantage. The second country, uh, the se second in line in terms of incentives is the country with the dominant currency, for instance, the US with the US dollar. And the US or the country with the dominant currency has strong incentives to launch digital, uh, CBDC early on due to a preemptive motive. If you launch CBDC early on, you preclude future competition from cryptocurrency. That is, you nip the growth from cryptocurrency in the bud in the early stages. And last, if not, if cryptocurrency has been widely adopted in this model, then the, the dominant currency must be digitized. Otherwise, it would lose its dominance. And countries with very weak currencies in this model, they do not benefit at all from launching the CBDC. Their currency is weak regardless, whether it's digitized or not. And in this case, they would be better off like adopting crypto as a legal tender within the territory. Overall, in this model, the rise of cryptocurrency not only can be seen as a financial innovation as such, but also incentivizes financial innovation by the central banks or governments, i.e. by incentivizing them to digitize the currency to launch CBDC. And last, the model also has a role for stable coins. 
So what are stable coins? Stable coins are essentially cryptocurrencies that are kind of pegged to the US dollar. What does this imply? In other words, due to the emergence of stable coins, kind of the US dollar has become some effective unit of account in the crypto space. And this in our model is kind of incorporated and reduces the incentives of the country with the dominant currency, i.e. the US, to digitize the US dollar. And why is that? Well, because of the emergence of these stable coins, the digital dollar kind of exists in the form of these stable coins, maybe not in the form you want it, but in other words, the crypto sector kind of creates some digital dollars in that way. Simply because the US dollar has this advantage that it serves kind of as the effective unit of account in this space. So let me go into the model, be skipping the literature. I think I would like to mention there's also recent work from the ECB on CBDC, like Tony Arnott and Peter Hoffman, as well as Katrin Assenmacher have published some survey and some theory paper next to it. So I cannot run through the literature. So the model is essentially a discrete time model and time is infinite whereby time runs with increments dt. And the notations are just, so we set the model up in discrete time, but in the end of the day, we do a continuous time limit because it's more tractable. And the economy is kind of populated for, by one representative overlapping generation household, which is born at time t, endowed with one unit of the consumption good, but would like to store this consumption good and consume at its, essentially when it's old at time t plus dt. But the consumption good cannot be stored, so we need some store of value. And what is the store of value here? Well, it's money. And money comes in the form of three currencies, which are all, for simplicity now, in fixed unit supply and have some endogenous price in terms of the numeraire, the consumption good, denoted by PT to the power of X, where X indexes the three currencies A, B, and C. And as already mentioned in the introduction, kind of, um, currency A is a strong national currency, it can be seen as the dominant currency, think of it again as the US dollar. Currency B is a relatively weaker but no, and non-dominant currency, it can be still strong but it's just non-dominant, think of it maybe as uh, renminbi, British pound or the euro. And last there is um, one representative private cryptocurrency which broadly describes many forms of private money that are outside of the, private, of the banking system, stable coins, or money created by these private payment providers. Currencies carry in our model a convenience yield, which broadly captures the medium of exchange function of money, as well as the unit of account function of money. And to formalize this convenience yield, we essentially introduce MT to the power of X, which is simply the household's holdings of currency X at time T. And because money is the only store of value, this household will always invest it in its entire unit endowment um, in money. And so like mt to the power of A plus mt to the power of B plus mt to the power of C is simply one. So the convenience yield from, uh, cur from currency A is essentially characterized by a concave function V and a constant C set t to the power of x um, pre-multiplying this convenience yield function. And the convenience yield from currency C is also characterized similarly, but then Y, which is another variable, is pre-multiplying this convenience yield function. And this Y will move, so that's the, type, the convenience from deriving crypto, and as crypto becomes more adopted, Y will increase, and that will be the dynamically moving part in this model. So why is, uh, do we have this function V? Well, simply V is a concave function. It captures the imperfect substitutability of the, between the currencies. So we model here one representative household that populates kind of the world economy. And with this assumption, we simply capture that maybe some people in the US would like to hold US dollars and we in Europe, we would like to hold euros and there's obvious imperfect substitutability. I cannot pay with US dollars easily here. So cannot US citizens pay with euros in the US. And we have some additional elements which I cannot go through. There will be some endogenous inflation. There will be some taxes kind of uh, levied by the government. And this will essentially make um, fiat currency less attractive. So what does the household do? The household at any point in time decides which currency to hold, trading off kind of the convenience from holding a specific currency versus the relative appreciation and depreciation of this currency relative to the other ones. And that leads then kind of to this equilibrium condition in the second line, which simply states that the marginal convenience to holding Cryptocurrency C plus the expected appreciation of cryptocurrency C must in equilibrium be equal 
to the marginal convenience to holding any fiat currency I plus essentially again the expected appreciation of fiat currency I. So in other words, if cryptocurrency becomes more convenient, the household substitutes from fiat toward cryptocurrency. If the household thinks that cryptocurrency is not convenient today, but maybe becomes so in the future and appreciates in price, then also the household substitutes toward cryptocurrency. And if a currency has a lot of inflation, then you go away from it. Very intuitive. So like what's special here about crypto? We assume that crypto is something like uh, that came up recently, that's dynamically evolving, that's dynamically adopted. And in particular, the convenience to holding crypto, characterized by Y, is growing over time. In particular, dynamically and endogenously growing. In effect, like as we stipulated here, the more people adopt crypto today, the higher the convenience tomorrow, the more people adopt crypto tomorrow, so the price is higher. And that feeds back again the decision today, because you're anticipating that the price is increasing. And that leads then kind of to some, to some exponential growth. Could be also modified, we could also account for crashes, we could also account for maybe that the sector dies. But think of this model just describing the scenario that we have like this private cryptocurrency growing over time and how should governments react. The other scenario that the sector dies is less interesting in this case. So what is also special about crypto and its relation to currency A? Well, we also captured that like um, the US dollar is kind of the unit of account in this crypto space which has led to the emergence of these stable coins, which are cryptocurrencies packed to the US dollar and also partially backed by US dollars. And how do we incorporate this in the model? Well, essentially some fraction theta, which could be maybe the fraction of stable coins within the crypto market cap, is backed by currency A. This essentially uh, captures simply the US dollar as kind of unit of account. So you need like some cryptocurrencies packed to the US dollar, and to stabilize them, you need, they need to also be backed by US dollar assets. And what does this mean kind of for currency A? Well, currency A has like some direct demand from the households, as well as some indirect demand induced by the crypto sector. So the more adopted cryptocurrency is, the more dollars people also demand, because kind of dollars are the unit of account in this sector. And the last part of the model essentially, which I will introduce is, what do we mean by CBDC? what is happening here with digitization. All we assume is essentially that the country has, an, uh, has essentially the option, any country A or B has the option to invest and to digitize the currency, which makes the currency more convenient. So how does this relate to CBDC? So implicitly we assume kind of when a country launches CBDC, then the convenience to holding this currency kind of increases. Why is this so? Well, I refer essentially everyone interested maybe to the survey by Katrin Assenmaier, Tony Arnott, um, there's many reasons why CBDC might make a currency more convenient. It could be related to privacy, it could be related to payment efficiency, it could be also related maybe to other digital applications that are then accessible via the currency or so on. We don't take a stance, we just assume launching CBDC increases the convenience. And in particular country X, uh, which could be country A or B, endogenously chooses some effort to digitize the currency or some investment. And when you try to digitize your currency, it's not possible immediately, so you have to wait a little bit. There's some delay. And in particular, if you try to do so, try to develop digital currency, you might always have to wait a little bit until you really succeed, until you really implement it. So we capture simply that um, you will successfully launch CBDC at some random time, t to the power of x, and this kind of uh, time arrives earlier, the more resources you expend. The last part, what does the government or central bank do? So like we mix these two terms while it's not strictly possible. Well, the government in our model has this objective here in equation one, which simply says intuitively that the government or the central bank would like to maximize the adoption of its currency. Why is this the case? Well, we generally, there's other objectives. You might think there's price stability objectives or there's some objectives tied to the real economy. But here we say that we would like to maximize the adoption. How to square this? Simply said, if you may, can uh, have a high adoption of your currency, you have a better possibility to conduct monetary policy. You might have better possibilities to, uh, you might have uh, better means to ensure financial stability. If on the other hand, the adoption of your currency goes down and you might even lose your unit of account function, then you cannot ensure price stability. In other words, government in this model maximize adoption value or the strengths of its currency, which is capturing reduced form some measure that you can essentially do your monetary policy and so on. So what is coming out of this model? 
the key issue what we're interested in, which country moves first in digitizing their currency, which country benefits the most, and why is this so? So this model, we essentially look at countries' efforts to launch CBDC early on. And panel A essentially depicts the effort by country A. Again, country A is the country with the dominant currency, i.e. the US, and country B is the country with the less with the non-dominant but possibly strong currency. And the effort of country B to launch CBDC is, the, is essentially depicted in panel B. What panel uh, D essentially shows is that country B in our model has the higher incentives to issue CBDC. Why is that? Well, country A already has a natural advantage in this space because its currency is already a unit of account in the crypto space. So any growth in the crypto space harms country B more than it does then it harms country A. So country B has the higher incentives essentially to digitize the currency to fend off the competition from cryptocurrency. And another thing here that can occur in the model is kind of you get a first mover advantage. If you move first in digitizing your currency, you can also like kind of get some additional adoption of your currency by taking away the adoption from the stronger currency. Three minutes left. Three minutes, thanks so much. What does country A would like to do? Well, country A has also relatively high incentives to launch CBDC in the beginning. Why is that? If country A faces sufficient threat from cryptocurrency, there's a preemptive motive. If you launch CBDC early on, if you digitize your currency early on, you reduce the adoption of cryptocurrency today, which kind of dampens the future growth of cryptocurrency. In other words, by digitizing your currency, you nip future cryptocurrency growth in the bud, precluding future competition from cryptocurrency. In other words, you can interpret this as a killer adoption. You adopt the technology and kill other developments. But if you don't launch CBDC early on enough as country A, then your incentives dip again while they increase in the end again. So this is why we have this double peaked um, shape in panel A. And essentially the last peak simply captures that once cryptocurrency in our model has become sufficiently convenient, so Y or log Y is sufficiently large, then digitization is unavoidable. Let me go to the next uh, plot, which is essentially leading to the pecking order from this model. What do we plot here? So essentially, panel A plots the average effort or the average incentives to launch CBDC of countries A and B, whereas country B, uh, panel B, plots the difference, and country, uh, panel B plots essentially the sum. And um, kind of, we, va we vary here one parameter, pi B, which is, which is capturing inversely the strength of currency B. So think of, when pi b increases, then currency b becomes weaker. What can be seen is that b's incentive to launch CBDC are u-shaped in its relative weakness. In other words, country b has the largest incentives to launch CBDC if it's not too strong, if its currency is not too strong and not too weak. And that kind of leads to the um, pecking order we have also already described in the introduction. The pegging order kind of stipulates that countries with relatively strong but non-dominant currencies have the highest incentives to launch CBDC early on. Again, to fend off competition from cryptocurrency, you gain a potential first move advantage. The next in line in terms of incentive is the country with the dominant currency, the US with the US dollar, and the lowest incentives to launch CBDC are borne by the countries with very weak currencies in our model. These countries have weak currencies regardless of whether they are digitized. So let me conclude with the last uh, again, highlighting the role of stable coins and fiat backed cryptocurrency. So, stable coins, as I already said, is a cryptocurrency packed to the fiat currency. And the notable um, observation here is that this fiat currency is in almost all of the cases the US dollar. And what does this uh, essentially imply? Well, why do we need stable coins? We need stable coins because the US dollar is kind of the effective unit of account in the crypto space. So, people were demanding some crypto dollar kind of. And that has led to the emergence of these stable coins. Many stable coins are therefore pegged to the US dollar. And for this pegging to work, they're also backed by US dollar reserves. And the ones that were not backed by the US dollar reserves have partially failed. One. And the model essentially implies that currency A has a natural advantage. It both has a, faces a direct demand from the household who wants to hold currency A. It also has a direct demand from the household because the households hold cryptocurrency and kind of therefore implicitly demand dollars because dollars is the unit of account in the space. Simon, your time is almost up. It's okay, thank you so much. I conclude with this slide. What does it essentially mean here? So kind of that the fact that the country with the dominant currency has this natural advantage 
by being the unit of account undermines the incentives to digitize the currency. In other words, these stablecoins or by, through the appropriate regulation of these stablecoins could be on the other end also an advantage because it's kind of like already there is a digital dollar and once you regulate it, you might uh, transform it to the way you want. So like, uh, let me at this point conclude. Thanks so much for all the attention. This is a dynamic model of currency competition with endogenous uh, digitization. CBDC is a response to growing competition from cryptocurrency in this model. I would like to emphasize this model is obviously carried out under, under two important assumptions. The first is that CBDC is improving the convenience to any specific currency. The second is that there is actually indeed a growing competition uh, from private digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, or private digital payment systems. If this is not the case, then the model would also be altered, kind of. This is on the path, assuming that these things continue to grow. Thanks so much for all the attention. I'm looking forward to Morten's comments. Thank you. So the discussion will be done by Morten Beck from the Bank of International Settlements, who I think through his function is ideally placed to discuss this topic. Oh, yes. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the kind presentation, uh, kind invitation to, to come here and discuss this uh, great paper. I should just say that whatever I say almost surely does not reflect the views of the BIS. Uh, but let me just first touch on, I work for the uh, BIS Innovation Hub. What is the BIS Innovation Hub? Just very clearly, we started out with three centers in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Switzerland. We've opened up two more in Stockholm and London, and later we will have one here for the Eurozone in Frankfurt and Paris, and even later one in Toronto, and we have a strategic partnership uh, with New York Innovation Center, which is run for the Federal Reserve out of the Federal Reserve Bank um, of New York. And so we started as a scale-up, a startup, and we are slowly becoming a scale-up. Uh, I always say central banks and innovation is a bit of a contradiction in terms, so I think we are like a bumblebee something that in theory should not be able to fly, but we are off the ground and I think generally flying in, in the right direction. So what is it actually that we do? I like to use the Econ 101, like production possibility frontier. So we're really trying to move out the technology frontier for central banks, maybe move central banks to the efficient frontier and also moving out the efficient frontier. So how do we do that? We do that by doing actual technology projects. And yesterday we announced together uh, with the uh, Banque de France, uh, the Swiss National Bank and the Monetary Authority of uh, Singapore, this idea of actually trying to build what is known as an automated market maker, something that comes out of DeFi, but in a world where central banks have actually issued wholesale CBDC, how would you do liquidity and FX uh, in such a world? And there we are trying to borrow some of the techniques that actually comes out of this uh, uh, DeFi world. I think it's very exciting. It's kind of like um, not maybe beyond the horizon kind of thinking and that's that's what I think an innovation hub uh, should do. Anyway, back to this paper. I think it's a great paper. This is from my daughter's writing class, right? And this is what you need to have to, in order to write a, a good paper. I think in these times with the internet, they now put this plagiarism uh, up front because, uh, you know, I don't think they did that back in my days. But anyway, the good thing about this paper is that I think it, it has all these things, right? It's research work, it's really high quality work, it's a great paper. Uh, I think some of the content is actually quite creative. And the delivery is maybe not fast, it's never fast for an academic paper, but it's very, very good. So I think, I think that's excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the definition of a CBDC, some things, I will say a few words about CBDC data. Then I'll very briefly discuss kind of like the key things in the model, and then I'll have a few conclusions. Uh, so definition. So I, I think you can explain uh, CBDC in one equation. So what is this? Uh, so the right-hand side of the equation is basically short for making M0 great again, right? This is what it's all about, right? Cash, we need to make base money great again. All right, that's a bad joke, but this is the only one I have. Um, but what are central bank digital currencies? And I think a couple of years ago, we wrote this paper on, on basically that, and we tried to define four key features of money, whether it's accessible, whether it's electronic, whether it's issued by the central bank slash the state, and whether you can transfer it peer to peer. And that allows us to define basically four kinds of uh, central bank digital currency, 
The key one is the one that we know today, which is the reserves, but that we did not denote as central bank digital currency. So we had two, we had wholesale CBDC, that would be some form of tokenized uh, uh, central bank money for banks. And then there was two types of uh, retail CBDC, one that was based on tradi more traditional um, um, account-based technology, and then uh, something that was based maybe on DLT or some of these newer technologies. So those are both retail CBDC. This paper just focuses, I think, on retail CBDC and doesn't really care for good reasons whether it's one technology and the other and, and, and does not really look into wholesale CBDC, which I think is fine. Um, the data. So the BIS actually published very similar data to uh, the data that was shown. And, and so the same picture uh, emerges as the one that came from the CBDC tracker, which I think. But what is nice here is that it highlights some of the countries in the Caribbean and, and Africa that are actually very active in, in CBDC. So that's actually where the action is right now, right? So it's, I think it's a stylized fact that the action in introducing real uh, CBDCs are in Africa and or in the Caribbean. So Jamaica has just gone live or with a pilot that, uh, and I think it's a, the the motto is like no money, no problem. So so it's kind of uh, kind of cute. There's the the Bahamian uh, sand dollar. There's something for the East Caribbean Central Bank, and then there's a couple of ones that are actually going on in Africa at the moment, uh, especially Nigeria with the E Naira. Which is uh, up and running. So, so whether whether this is a whether these are really weak currencies or not, we we can have a debate. But I think this is the uh, a stylized fact that the, these are actually the ones that are moving first. Um, this should be model, I think. Yes. So, so the, what the model really does is that it combines two concepts of two strands of literature. One is about currency substitution, which is really the use of a foreign currency in parallel parallel or instead of the domestic currency. And then there's the currency competition literature, which is the free entry of private sector firm into the issuance of a currency. And here I think you need to uh, cite Hayek, you know. Um, I, I love uh, Ricardo, I love uh, Lagos Wright and stuff like that, but I think really this is uh, Hayek that, that you would have to uh, talk about. And those two are both combined into the model, which is super nice. What is the model? The model is really a, a two-player game, right? And where each have, each player is a country A and we have country B. There's also the, the cryptocurrency in there, but the, the cryptocurrency doesn't play any strategies. And so really the uh, country A and country B really have three strategies, today, tomorrow, or never, uh, in terms of adoption of uh, CBDC. Uh, and so you have this three by three game. And so on the train ride up here, I tried to plug it in. I, w I wasn't... Um, so, so here there's an incentive to implement uh, CBDC, uh, and that's really uh, around maintaining a seniorage, okay? So, so the, the objectives of the countries are really to protect or gain a seniorage. Um, and, but then you have to invest in order to implement uh, CBDC, and I just assume that it's very expensive for the dominant country to implement, uh, to in, uh, to implement the CBDC today. I think the reasoning would be that the dominant country, because you are the dominant country, you don't have to invest so much in your financial market infrastructure and so on and so forth. So actually to take this leap, uh, you would have to do a lot. Maybe whether that's a true reflection of the US, I guess people, we can disagree on that, but it's just that it, it's harder for the, the dominant country to uh, implement uh, a CBDC. And then there's this, uh, also this thread in here. This is this uh, Bitcoin symbol. This is like the seniorage loss for uh, Bitcoin actually being adopted into your country. Um, and then you can, with different assumptions, you, you can set up the game and then you can actually get the Nash equilibrium to be this one where the uh, dominant country implements tomorrow and the non-dominant country implements uh, today. So really, this is just to show, and then under certain assumptions, then you can also get, if the country is very, very weak, then it never um, implements, but the dominant country implements tomorrow. Uh, and then the non-dominant currency, as was mentioned, which could be the euro or the Swiss franc, so the, the Chinese currency, would then try and gain this first mover advantage as a way of making sure that the dollar doesn't take over in the digital world in their domestic uh, settings. Okay, so kind of like some of the conclusions. I think uh, this is the, the governor of the uh, 
Bank of France or Bank de France. He's also the chairman of the BIS. Um, and so he gave a speech and I think he actually lays out kind of like the thinking of uh, uh, central banks at the moment, right? So, so a lot of the use cases are not definitely fixed yet when it comes to CBDC. But there are some very material reasons for uh, to consider the issuance of a digital euro. And one is just to preserve and the usability of central bank money. You know, if you're a central bank and you think you need to be, uh, if you want to be relevant in the future, you might need to do something in, in CBDC. But also, and these are these two more, perhaps more geopolitical reasons. One is like the monetary sovereignty. This is the thing that, that really got people up in arms with, uh, with Facebook. And then there's also to support the strategic autonomy of the European continent. So these are some lofty, more political science reasons, which, which I think economics might have a harder time uh, actually explaining. Um, so the way that I look at it, I think we are in a situation now where we're in, this, we're in a scramble for the future monetary system. And there's like two layers. One is who should provide the money of the future. It's going to be crypto, central banks. I wouldn't discard commercial banks yet, so I put them in. So, and, and then there's like some trade-offs between them, between the central bank and the commercial bank. If the central bank issues CPDC, there's, there's a key issue around uh, uh, funding. And the commercial banks and the uh, crypto is really who has the contact to, to the end users. But then there's also another layer, which is more like the, the geopolitical layer, which is really between uh, countries and our currencies. And this is also uh, what this paper also touches on. So between uh, China and the US or the Euro, so maybe there's a, an issue around who wants to be or who will be the reserve currency between the US and the um, emerging markets is something around dollarization and then between China and the emerging markets is like is can China be this new vehicle currency in which trade takes place so combining all those together and they are all intertwined so I think it's a very interesting topic to analyze and research and I think this paper does a really good job of like trying to specify uh, some of the the key uh, trade-offs so my final slide in, in conclusion was really, I was thinking when I read it, I said, well, you should just take out this uh, coming part of the title. It's not the coming, it's just the battle of uh, uh, digital currencies. But then I noted that the, the, I, hadn't, I hadn't noticed the cuteness that is, this actually becomes CBDC. So I guess my suggestion now is just to say the current battle of the uh, digital. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Morten. <laughs> I would now like to take a few questions, uh, if there are any in the room. So if there aren't, I would have one. So yeah, sure. Yeah, you're assuming that uh, these are countries maximizing the adoption of their currency, and this is captured in this uh, yes. convenience yield function. And I have some doubts whether this function is really reflecting reality in the sense that, in the end, it's users adopting these things, and so the, the, the currency they want to trade in. And it's um, probably also some network effects related in there, which are not fully captured by a concave function. So I think it would be interesting also to reflect a little bit on how the function could look like if you have kind of network effects, maybe inside the country, but also maybe on international scale. And at what point uh, monetary sovereignty would be threatened. So especially when there is a foreign cryptocurrency coming into a country. So you, you have these players and the maximization, but I'm not quite sure whether this is really how this adoption would, would look like. No, thanks for this uh, excellent comment. Yeah, so like uh, you're mentioning one important point here, there's this network effects, yeah. So why we don't uh, exactly model it there, of course, I agree with you, they are certainly there and they are kind of a little bit omitted. The concave functions are just something else. It's like uh, actually suggests, oh, this network effects must be rather weak. But like if there are relatively strong network effects, then it would be something we, you could refer to as tipping. Yeah? So like if uh, some foreign currency or cryptocurrency gains su sufficient adoption, then um, it would become even a higher threat to the national currency because like these network effects then lead to some tipping that's such that uh, once it's sufficiently adopted, some foreign currency or cryptocurrency, it's, like it's unavoidable to curb it kind of back. Yeah, so I fully agree with you. We should, we should definitely look into that and also to what extent these functional forms describe reality. That's definitely some uh, debate and like we haven't read, uh, it's, very, it's very difficult to capture 
many of the realities here. So it's kind of a qualitative model at this point. But if one wanted to take it a step further, one would have to address your comment more seriously. Yeah, to make things even more complicated, you yes, could also yeah, think of yeah. um, governments taking measures to uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, fend off this threat by either imposing restrictions of the use of currency or by giving yeah, changing the remuneration of a CBDC. Yeah. So you could also have strategic um, battling mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on that level. Yeah, so that's also correct. Yeah, so like we abstract here from regulation. So we think, as we think about it, is essentially you can do certain things with regulation, but you maybe cannot achieve the complete ban of these cryptocurrencies. You cannot curb it fully back. You can only curb it back to some extent. And if you try to do more, maybe if you try to ban it completely, it would be costly. So you may want to take other actions which are not direct regulation, and then kind of this digitization of CBDC comes into play. <sighs> But that's also a very important point that's mentioned here and I haven't discussed in the presentation. And if one wanted to take this model in a more quantitative sense, then obviously one would have to also address uh, this point of regulation. So there's also very nice work, like, I mean, this is emerging literature, but there's also very nice quantitative work coming out on this topic from the CBDC, actually, like uh, um, Frank Smets, Manuel Munoz have an excellent paper. It's a slightly different topic, but this is like more quantitative models that can be used essentially to quantify the benefits of CBDC issuance. Yeah, we have an online question coming in from Cyril Monet. And Cyril is asking, is there a version of Gresham's law in the paper? For example, people would hold dollar to save, but crypto to, ter to trade. So crypto, the bad money, would drive out the dollar, the good money, as a means to pay. Oh, this is a very good question as well. So, like, unfortunately, I cannot answer this probably to a satisfactory point because um, we model kind of saving and trading. We model a saving is like fine. This is like kind of not not necessarily reduced form model. We have an overlapping generations household. Someone would like to save when young and consume when old. But kind of trade is not modeled explicitly. We simply assume a convenience yield that could capture the trade that occurs in specific currency, could capture for the medium of exchange function, and also could capture for the unit of account function, also central to trade. So like, uh, there won't be a version of Gresham's law, at least uh, uh, unless you were to microfound the trade, I would believe. But this is a very good question. I haven't thought about it so far. So maybe if you would like to react to Morton's discussion as yeah, well, so discussion was, particularly uh, yeah. the question on why uh, African countries are the first movers, I think. Yeah, so like uh, I also looked into that recently. So like, uh, so the model is essentially not capturing probably all these proper, uh, all these uh, features that led to these uh, many of these countries adopting uh, C uh, CBDC or developing CBDC. I guess in the Bahamas, like the the reason for for why uh, reason explaining the launch of CBDC would be simply that like it's on an island and physical cash would be difficult to transport and these type of things. So yeah, there might be other reasons uh, outside of the model that uh, definitely that have led to the development of CBDC in these countries. So our model is just here currency competition, uh, just focuses essentially on the currency competition aspect. But as I said, there might be other features outside of the model that essentially um, explain the issuance of CBDC by certain countries and maybe why other countries do not move. Morton's discussion was very helpful because he also essentially uh, touched, uh, gave us again a very good overview about the state of CBDC initiatives, why we should launch CBDC, and like there's very many useful resources on that by the BIS. And also, like um, I liked this last graph with the two triangles that were intertwined, um, essentially highlighting kind of how the monetary systems uh, is kind of structured and the, the interactions between the different countries. Yeah, so very helpful, and I would appreciate if you could send the discussion slides to me. Thanks a lot. So this concludes the first session of this morning, and then uh, we will have a coffee break. And I like to have you come back at eleven or eleven fifteen, Sebastian. At eleven. Thanks a lot to everybody. Yeah.